Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Conversations on Conversations, where each week we explore a topic to help us have more powerful conversations with ourselves and others. I'm your host, Sarah Noel Wilson, and joining me back is my dear friend, a colleague, Dr. Teresa Peterson. Hello. Now, for those of you, hi, welcome to the show, Teresa. Thanks. Good to be back. Fancy meeting yes. you here. Good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you who are watching on YouTube and watching the video, you will notice that our background is different. And for those of you who are listening, you might notice a little bit of difference in our sound. That is because, my friends, I got moved out of the corner in the basement and I have a proper office with a proper door and I'm going to give you way too much information, but I'm not in the carpet where the dogs would always pee. So it is just a glorious day all around. It's a new day. (laughs) So bear with us as we figure all of this new setting out. So we're super excited. Uh, Let's do just a a quick introduction of Dr. Teresa Peterson. For those of you who may be joining us and haven't listened to some of our previous conversations or maybe don't follow us on the newsletter, Dr. Teresa Peterson has her doctorate of education. She has a decades upon decades worth of experience in learning in the public school system. She's been a part of the Snowco team for the last five and a half years, will be six years this summer. Yeah. And she is our director of research and learning or learning and development. It's just all the things. She just wears all the hats. So So many hats. It's the title doesn't even... (laughs) fit because of the expansiveness of your role. Um, But she works very closely. She and I work really closely together in content development, experience design. She works very closely with clients. She has her own clients. And today we wanted to talk about this idea of unlearning. And I will tee it over to Teresa. Before we get into the topic of unlearning, Teresa, what's new Mm. since last time it can't be what's new since last time we talked yesterday but what is new (laughs) since last time this audience has has been with us everyone i just want you to know i made it through my first year as a show choir parent (laughs) um so if i don't know if there's a support group i just have to start resting up for next year um so that's that's big on my mind and in my heart and tomorrow i'll be making a yellow cake I just yeah, that was a lot of conversations (laughs) about this yellow cake. Is show choir a global thing for our international audiences? Maybe you explain what show choir (laughs) is for or for folks who aren't even global who need to know. Yes. So need is a strong word. It's who might be interested in knowing. I I listen to some podcasts where they might say, like, if this is of no interest to you, just skip ahead about 20 (laughs) seconds. Um, Show choir, I think, is particularly big in the Midwest United States, but I do think it has a global presence on some realm. But show choir is probably best visualized from the show Glee. So if you've watched Glee, so it's like singing and dancing and twirling and sequence and just all sorts of very uh, choreographed everyone is dancing everyone is singing lots of jazz hands lots of smiling yes so much moving around you know lots of yelling by the audience (laughs) so it's it's you have to really be ready to take it in so I made and for for those of you who've listened before maybe you know my energy is like kind of even keel gal you know just doing my thing so I have to get like emotionally prepared to go in there, but I made it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I love it so much. Um, Okay. So now on to our topic of unlearning. And I, you know, what I'll, I'll start by saying and then turn it over to you is so often when we are working with companies and they are bringing us in, or even if it's a keynote, the thing that we hear a lot is like, we need new stuff. We need new tools. We need new practices. We need new this, new that. And that is valuable. We do need new ways of thinking. We need new ways of doing things. But that isn't the only way that we can learn in the way that we can change our behavior. So how how would you describe, Teresa, this idea of unlearning? Unlearning. I want to start by echoing what you were saying, that the, 
most common thing we hear from folks is new tools, new tools, new tools. And I think, I think we can do a good job of delivering those new tools. And I think there are lots of places you can go to find new tools, whether it's articles, TED Talks, podcasts. There are no shortage of places to find new tools. But the issue is, first of all, you know, and this is my bias, we have probably way more exposure to tools that we can't use effectively or we've used mm. once and it kind of goes mm. like, I don't know, this reminds me of home remodeling where you get some highly specialized thing to do a staircase and then maybe you make one stair and you're like, I better hire this done, it's a mess. And then before you know it, like you've just got this tool hanging on forever, but you're not great with it anyway. Mm. Um, that might be related to what's going on in my house right now, but that's an aside. <laughs> that could be a highly specific personal example. But, um, but we've got this sense of we can get so much exposure, but if we can't do anything with them, we're kind of stuck. So learning more isn't going to help us utilize what's already in there mm. any better. So I think that's one layer that we often um, talk about. And then this other idea is if I've got some serious cracks in my foundation and, and maybe that foundation is skills or ideas, specifically ideas and mindsets, uh, well-worn behaviors that are getting in the way of how I'm showing up with people, dumping a bunch of new stuff on there isn't going to do the trick. Right. I have to untangle some of what's getting in the way. I have to unlearn some of those behaviors. And that's something, you know, I certainly get really excited about this idea of unlearning, but it's quite provocative for people. Um, sometimes when we're meeting with folks and we use this phrase unlearning, you know, you see a little seat shifting. You know, you see a little, what exactly does that mean? I think a misunderstanding about this idea of unlearning would mean everything I ever knew is suddenly irrelevant and I'm starting mm. back at the mm. square one kind of situation. Um, that isn't what it is, right? But we might think about it as what do we need to prune out of there? You know, what's getting in the way? What's tangled up that's keeping us from moving forward? Because we can have many new tools. And if we don't understand maybe how they're incompatible with how we've been showing up, forget it. Yeah. It's the, when you were talking, <laughs> going on the remodeling, when you were talking about the cracks in the foundation, our last house had water in the basement. And all I kept thinking was, yeah, and if you don't take care of those, then those new tools eventually just become damaged by the water that's seeping in and won't be functional yeah. anyway. Well, and how many times, you know, and I'm thinking of other places I've worked and thinking of folks that we talk to all the time. Um, it is very common for people to feel like it was the fault of the tools. Like we wanted oh, yeah. new tools and you came yeah. in and then these tools didn't work. And it's mm -hmm. like, maybe you didn't have the skill to do it. Maybe you didn't have an interest in doing it. Um, I think that's a, a common place people get stuck. Just like you're describing with the basement of, we could have patched it up a little bit and made it look fresh enough, but the water is going to come in and contaminate everything again because the existing you know, I, I don't like to think of humans as having structural problems, right? But just we'll go with the metaphor. But when we have existing problems, significant problems and mindset that are getting in the way, anything you throw at it is just just going to bounce off or, I don't know, just pop and go flat. Yeah. Well, and you're... Your that language you use of pruning, I think is is really effective. Because again, to echo what Teresa had said that sometimes when, when folks and again, not everyone, but when some folks have heard us use this term, you know, what do we need to unlearn? Or how do we explore this? Is that it implies that you were wrong. And and in, you know, in most situations with dealing with humans and human relationships and communications, there's no right or wrong. It's just what's effective and what's not effective, given the moment, given the audience. 
and and a willingness to be able to understand an analogy I think folks on this show have maybe heard me use and one I know we talk about is the idea of foot on the gas, foot on the brake. If I have my foot on the gas and it's my enthusiasm to make this change, it's my the tools that I'm getting, okay, I'm going to be a better listener, I'm going to do this, and that's my foot on the gas. But if I do not interrogate, if I do not understand what assumptions I'm holding, what biases I might have, what limitations of my skills I might have, that foot on the brake means I'm sort of like at best going to just like burn forward, but at worst, I'm just going to keep circling. And, and so when we think about, um, you know, and, and, and to connect it to the, the focus of the show, which has always been conversations we have with ourselves and others, even that is a form of unlearning. What, What's the conversations I'm having with myself that aren't serving me? Or what are the ways I'm showing up in my conversations with others? So as we as we explore this idea, well, there's a couple of things that I think we can explore throughout our conversation is what has unlearning looked like for us, mm. right? What are examples mm. of that? But first, I want to start from a place of what, what does it look like? to start to unlearn? Or what are some strategies or questions we can ask? So imagine you're like, I want to get better at X. I want to improve whatever it is. Where might be some places for folks to start, Teresa? So the first thing that came up for me when you mentioned that was, I want us to differentiate even a little more. Yeah, please. Um, unlearning at, through my eyes, uh, means I have a developed habit. I run this on autopilot. Mm, mm. I think that's a really important distinction because I'm thinking about, you know, this isn't a work example, but let's picture someone uh, who's been using training wheels and they can't stop putting that left foot down, right? But it's not quite autopilot for them. They're still moving forward. Uh, there are lots of very easy structural things we can do. We can just take one wheel off. We could take both wheels off. Like we could do so many things. It's not ingrained habit yet. Um, we're thinking about things we do on autopilot, mm. particularly related to how we connect with people. And I think, you know, there's so many high tech illustrations of like the brain and like neural pathways and like synapse, but like just picture Clark W. Griswold on that sled <laughs> in Christmas vacation, <laughs> lightning fast, you know, like he's just going down the hill. It is so fast. Um, you, you have to even raise your awareness that you're doing it right. Yeah. That's what's at kind of that, um, at the heart of unlearning is a very ingrained habit. And something mm. else that came up as you were, uh, talking there was, um, so we have this idea of this ingrained habit, something that is on autopilot and a place that folks get stuck sometimes is, again, this isn't progressive skill development. Think of the kid riding the bike where it's generally going in the right direction. We make some tweaks along the way. This is like, if I want to get better at something, I'm going to have to let something go. Mm. I've been doing this so long, this one way, maybe without even realizing it. And the departure, and I'm thinking about some conversations we've had recently, right, mm -hmm. Sarah, where mm -hmm. the departure, the where I am now, and maybe maybe where I'm at is where all managers are, you know, hypothetically, and collectively where we need to get to is so fundamentally different. There's no way I can take everything I have with me right now to this new place. I'm going to have to let some of that go, drop some weight off of that hot air balloon or whatever, right? Like to get up to where I'm headed. Um, so that feels like an important distinction to me. So I think places to start would be, mm, let's just use one of our favorite things, self-awareness, right? I mm -hmm. have to even become aware of the things I do on autopilot. And that's challenging because your brain is lightning fast. Um, so getting as specific as possible, is it in conversation? Is it in my one-on-ones? Is it in my conversations with this person? Is it in my Monday meeting? If you want to focus on unlearning, I want you to narrow the scope very small so you can keep your brain's attention, uh, on those autopilot behaviors. So mm -hmm. that's my starting point. What comes up for you, Sarah, as you yeah. hear that? Uh, 
A, a couple of things. I, I'll share a little bit later about some strategies of how you can use other people who can mm. write, write yeah. co-pilot with you, be part of your team, because one of the things that can make it difficult, and I've experienced this in my life, I've seen it in others, is that you can be aware of something, and to your point, when it's such an autopilot response, you may never you'll likely never catch it every time you do it. But being able to have other people in your world who know that you're working on it. So that was one thing that was coming up. But mm. the, this feels like a really good segue into talking about the practice of the courageous audit. Mm. Because you don't always know what you don't know. And sometimes it takes seeing somebody do something a different way. Sometimes it takes getting feedback that is maybe not the feedback you wanted. Maybe it is... Um, wanting to try to show up differently. Maybe you're a first time manager and you're like, how do I, how do I be better than the managers I've had? And, and so it can be a little overwhelming or people can be uncertain with how, well, how do I identify what I'm doing? If I, if I knew I would have changed them already. So talk to us. So my brain, I guess, just to check in with you, mm. is like, this feels like a really good spot to talk about the courageous audit work. Sure. So something that makes a courageous audit really valuable is having a very clear picture of where it is you're trying to go, hmm. right? Because otherwise it's too easy to get lost or maybe to pick out the wrong thing. So as you're thinking about unlearning, have a very clear picture in your mind. Um, and usually when I'm starting on this work of a courageous audit with another person, and this is coming from the work of immunity to change, which is so close to our heart, I ask them to think about what they want to get better at and then to describe what would it look like? What would it feel like? What would it sound like? Like bring it to life as much as you can. Um, again, maybe you've seen someone do it really well. Maybe it's, I want to do this as well as Nick Wilson does it, right? Like get it as very clear as you can. And then from that very clear image in your mind, um, now we can go two ways. One way I do love to start, which is not formally part of the process, mm -hmm. is more appreciative inquiry, but is to say, mm -hmm. what am I already doing that's actually getting me closer? So maybe I already fundamentally respect the people around me, right? Like maybe I already have that in my heart. Maybe I already have one-on-ones on the calendar. Maybe I already, whatever, fill in the blank. It feels like a good moment to pause and like prime yourself a little, give yourself some a little boost, uh, because we know the next phase is, can be really hard of the courageous audit. What am I doing that's getting in the way? And what am I not doing that's getting in the way? So the good thing is I've got these one on one schedule. What's getting in the way is um, I'm actually not coming with any talking points organized. Mm, mm. Um, I haven't looked back at the last week to see something we might celebrate together so I can kick it off on a good foot. Um, I dominate the conversation, right? Um, I've already got my mind made up before the person comes in how this is going to go. Um, some people feel like a waste of time for a one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just spitballing a whole yeah, bunch that yeah. we've heard regularly. But uh, but in that spirit, um, again, unlearning requires, you know, picture a surgeon and you're going to have to be very precise. We're not going in there and tearing the whole thing up. We are looking for what is not serving us, what is holding us back, what is getting in the way, and we're going to just go after those things. So again, I like the process of honoring, what am I already doing whether it's mindsets, whether it's structural things you have in place, and then what's getting in the way and what am I not doing that's getting in the way? And that's one of my favorite. Mm -hmm. And you can do this with yourself. And I'll tell you, sorry, we were talking about this yeah. yesterday, Sarah, in terms of like how like we pride ourselves, I think, you and I and everyone here at Team Sarah and Alyssa Inc. on tools for the whole person, ideas for the whole person. And we were talking a little bit about the young people in our lives mm, yesterday. Mm, and mm -hmm. you can absolutely use this courageous audit. Um, there is a loved one in my life and this person wants a clean room. And I, this is where, you know, a good catch and I'll do some modeling like of something I've unlearned. We'll tell, we'll tell it through this story. Growing up, what I learned was uh, the parent would just tell the kid for the most part, what needed to happen. And then the kid's job was just executing it or not and facing a consequence, right? Classic parenting kind of thing. <laughs> and 
what I'm working on, right? What I'm unlearning is um, that way it wasn't really serving me, didn't really serve my style, didn't really serve the end I was hoping for, you know, for an adult, young person becoming an adult in my care. Um, and so I use the courageous audit, like if you know that you want this clean room and, you know, describe it like stuff's off the bed, the area over here, you know, whatever, get clear about it in your mind. Um, what are you doing that's getting in the way? And the responses were great. I don't, I don't throw trash away. I just put my clothes on the floor instead of in a hamper. Mm. I, mm. you know, whatever. Okay. What are you not doing? Right. So you can use those in moments of what's getting in the way. And when someone can unlock that for themselves, that's way more powerful than me yeah. saying, well, you don't put your clothes in the hamper and you don't throw mm -hmm. any trash away mm -hmm. and you, you know, I know you're hiding candy under there, you know, or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fill in the blank. Right. But, um, but there's a lot of power in owning that audit because what we don't want to happen, we don't want people to feel shame about their patterns. Like if you want people to move forward, you just meet them where they're at. You just honor yeah. where they at, they're at and they go and there's power in them voicing, this isn't serving me or this thing I do is getting in the way. Now, yeah. how do I go forward with it? That's kind of the next phase, right? But, but that awareness of this is getting in my way is a powerful thing to say out loud. Yeah. And, and, and for a lot of folks that we work with when we do this practice, and this is true for us as well, because again, we, we never ask people to do things that we aren't actively mm -hmm. working on ourselves. For some people, that's enough to just, yeah. as soon as they say it, go, oh, okay. Okay. All right. I need to think about this differently. And then, and then there might be situations where you go, right, I don't, I do do that. And I don't like it. And I'm not, I don't like how that shows up. You know what I'm thinking for myself. I, one of the things that I continue to work on is uh, my sarcasm. I grew up in a very sarcastic family and, and I sarcasm is fine and can be lovely. And sarcasm is a very, very close cousin to contempt, which we know is one of the four like apocalyptic behaviors of, of ruining a relationship. And, uh, and so part of the reason why I'm trying to unlearn it is because it is in conflict with how I want to show up. Mm. I want to show up as somebody who is supportive. I want to show up as somebody who meets people where they're at, not teases them where they're at. I want to, yeah. right? Like I want to create safer environments and sarcasm can be misinterpreted. Mm. Um, it can come across as sharper than what you intended to. It can uh, un uh, dismiss, silence, shut people down. And so for me, I'm thinking about in that moment uh, of uh, as I'm, I'm assessing and going where like I it's it's become easy for me to sort of scale that back because it feels very tangible. Mm. Now, let's flip to another thing. And again, I'll use myself as an example. And then sure. we can talk about some uh, examples from uh, people we've worked with that are pretty consistent patterns. You know, a classic one I talk about is wanting to be a better listener. Mm. And, you know, and one of the things that I have to work on is interrupting people, whether it's internally interrupting or externally interrupting. Yeah. And well, and let's pause. Yeah. I want to zoom yeah. out for everybody listening. Did you hear the specificity Sarah had? Mm. I might be interrupting by saying something and I might be interrupting by my brain thinking what I would say if I yeah. let it come out of my mind. I mean, no, am I saying that with 100% yeah, love? Yeah, like, yeah. I just wanted to highlight that's mm. the level you've got to get to with mm -hmm. yourself. Yeah, go mm -hmm. ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, let's be even more specific, yeah. right? Like I, I often use this, this example of my husband's a slower talker than me. And so there were times, this is actually, I've gotten, I've, I've unlearned this one very successfully now, uh, but it's, it took a while that he might be telling a story that I feel like I know where it's going. And my, inside my head, like outwardly, it looks like I'm listening inside my head. I'm thinking, speed it up, buddy. I know where, where this is going, which is always fun to tell stories about Nick because he's listening in as our producer. So uh, <laughs> you're great, but, Nick. <laughs> yeah. But it's not as simple as saying, well, just don't interrupt anymore. Um, yeah. 
because, I mean, there's a couple of reasons for me. I know part of my interruption comes from my ADHD and my impulsivity. And sometimes that's just not in my control mm -hmm. or it takes it or it takes way more effort than I realize to be able to manage it mm. and to know situations where it's going to seep out yeah. <laughs> more. Yeah. But the other side of it is starting to get clear and interrogating, like, what is it serving when I interrupt, because there's something about when I'm interrupting that, yeah, it could be because of my impulsivity, but there are times when I'm interrupting because it's actually serving me in some way that I might not realize it. And I'm curious, like, uh, how you want to, how do you want to go into the next step of like oh, this yeah. without overcomplicating it? Yeah. Okay. One thing before we move forward. Yeah. If you are listening and you're going to conduct a courageous audit on yourself and I want to, I want mm. to be honest, it, it's called a courageous audit because there's an element of courage in telling on yourself, which is mm -hmm. a very technical term, uh, to tell on yourself. And if you're like me, uh, you might do this regularly and not vocalize it to anyone. You know, you mm -hmm. might process kind of internally. Maybe you tell your dog or your cat, you know, or that your favorite squirrel who comes by. Um, the, this process can be very solitary work, but it is also very powerful when shared with someone you trust. So, but if you're yeah. listening and you're doing this on your own, I like to have kind of my little flashing light on looking for the word time to come up because Without a doubt, someone oh, is going to list yeah. time as a barrier. You know, well, what, what I'm not doing? Well, I just don't have enough time, you know, and mm. bless it. Time always comes out with kind of a shrug, just kind of like, mm -hmm. a, oh, what am I supposed to do time? So if you're doing this process on your own or you're going to walk through it with someone else, maybe you and a, a colleague or a friend will do it together, you have to pick up the rock of time and look for those little creepy crawlies underneath. What is it about time? Is mm -hmm. it that you truly haven't prioritized it? Is it um, a common mm. one I hear is, I, I say this is important. I put no time on the schedule for it at all. Just like it's magically going to mm -hmm. happen, right? Mm -hmm. Time has also meant um, I put things on the schedule and then I just allow other things to creep in, you know? Um, so be on the lookout for that one. Uh, it always brings up a flashing light for me. So and well, and to that, and to that point, yeah, just a further clarification yeah. or addition is when we're doing a courageous audit, it is the behaviors, it is the things we are doing internally and yes. externally that are within our control. Thank you. Yes. It is not about external factors like, well, I can't be effective because my manager is doing this. Well, I can't be effective because my wife or my husband or my partner is doing this. Yeah. It's what are you doing that you have within your sphere of influence and yeah. control? Uh, yes. And so... Thank you so much for highlighting that because if you're doing an audit and you don't have a verb in there, you've, you're not quite there, right? Mm. So time Give is an just, example. Well, time. It's time. Well, time's a noun, right? Like time just exists. It's time is not like time as a concept is out of my control. How I'm using it. Am I not scheduling? Am I scheduling over? Um, oh, one I've heard that was so honest um, I say this is important, but also I know it's hard. So I intentionally fill my calendar to avoid doing it. Mm, that was mm. one that came out. And like, that's, that's how you unlock. That's how you start untangling, right? And like unlearning and then preparing yourself to learn something new in its place, right? Mm -hmm. So we could go a couple paths here, Sarah. So you, you touched on a phase of this process that for some folks is really valuable and necessary. I love that you said, for some people, the courageous audit is enough. Like, oh, I shined the light on myself or I said to myself or even to a colleague, I've been putting it off because I know it's hard, right? And that might be just enough to kind of unlock what's happening, mm -hmm. to get a, little, get a little traction, get you moving again. But when we really think about what's underneath, sometimes that's where we have to keep digging. Um, that common example that you used, and this one was real for you, but is one we hear often, right, is um, about listening. And why am I showing up the way I'm showing up? What is it serving for me to do this? Um, another one I hear a lot is collaboration, mm. right? I want to get better at collaborating but mm -hmm. I keep holding on to all the work myself, but mm -hmm. I never give anyone an update on what I'm going to do, but mm -hmm. I 
intentionally withhold some of the information so no one else can really fully contribute. And then I say, this is why I have to do it, right? Yeah. And we're so, delegating. Yes. That's another one. Oh, you yes. know, another one when we're working with managers is I want to be better at developing my team members. I want to empower <sighs> them. I want to set them up for success. Mm. I, uh, and then when they start to unpack, what are you doing? That's getting in the way. It's uh, I'm not letting them have any autonomy. Yeah. I'm um, asking them questions to get to my solutions. I'm, <laughs> um, uh, what are some of my favorite ones that often come up with this? And we're sharing this because you might resonate folks oh, yeah. like, oh, oh, that's me. Um, I do it because I, I don't think they can do it the right way, yeah. i.e. my way. <laughs> um, I, you know, like in, insert whatever, but yeah. that's another common one is the struggles around delegating and yes. setting other people up for success. And I think delegating is a great example. And I, I'm thinking of uh, one particular situation that you and I know well. I bet if we would ask this person, G person, G manager, what are some strategies for delegating? Yeah. This person could academically list 25 ways you could delegate work to someone else. It was not a skill deficit. It is, yeah. there is an ideological, there is a, there's a friction, right? There's a competing commitment at play. He wants to do a better job at this, but he's also committed to, and then it's just like gridlock, you know? So again, for some folks, it just takes shining a light on that. Now, if you're listening and, and you show, you, ooh, shown, is that the past? Shown? I, I don't is often the... <laughs> say shine, shown. shown. If you put a light <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you directed light toward that and that didn't work for you, that is not anything about you as a human. That means this particular issue, there's more to the story. So I just like to uh, give people a little love in that area because it would be easy. And I've gone down this path myself of why wasn't it enough for me to just look and be able to make these changes yeah, because yeah. some stuff's just more complicated. Yeah. That's just how it is. So, yeah. so again, uh, whether you're doing this yourself alongside someone, um, there is no shame in having to dig deeper. Like uh, yeah. saying, I got to dig deeper is a victory. I mean, that's very yeah. honorable yeah. thing to do. So, um, I, I want to highlight that because yeah. we, we tend to think if I need more, if I need more intervention, if I need more concentrated help, that it's uh, something's horribly wrong. But these are complicated issues. You know, we're yeah, trying to shine yeah. a light on the inner workings of your operating system, right? That to some extent are probably still working because you're mm -hmm. where you are and you're alive and moving and going. Um, but there is this idea of a competing commitment. And goodness, couldn't this be a whole other show on competing mm -hmm. commitments? But this idea that I'm actually doing these behaviors, many of them I know I'm doing. I think that's a good distinction. Mm -hmm. I, I have some awareness that I keep doing them. Because what's at stake if I don't feels mm -hmm. awful. I mean, there's something real clear in there. So if I'm not, you know, I'm going to go to an example you've shared a lot and I love it and I use it regularly because I'm afraid if I don't interrupt, I'll be ignored. Yeah. Right? I won't be heard. Yeah. Yeah. And, and how mm -hmm. terrible it would feel to feel ignored or not heard. Right. That's a terrible feeling. So like for some of us, we have to go now. I'm thinking back to very common, whether it's collaboration or delegation, the rub against that is usually I'll be obsolete or um, people will think I don't have it anymore. People will think yeah. I'm an idiot, right? There's, if you're listening, you're like, well, that doesn't sound, that sounds too severe. Part of the brain is holding on to this fear. And that's yeah. what's got you locked in place, right? Or, or not you maybe, but your team member or loved yeah. one. Yeah. Um, so there is more there to unravel. And that part, it's fun and it's a little tricky. Um, mm -hmm. And it requires us to really get the magnifying glass out. Um, but whether you are, whether you've got enough to unlock back at just that first step of the courageous audit, or whether you have to dig a little deeper, um, either way, the path forward is through some experimentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that and that willingness that, you know, the whole for me, the example of, oh, if I don't interrupt, there's some part of my brain that believes if I don't interrupt, I won't be heard. Yeah. You can, I even saying that out loud is like, well, I know that that's not true. Yeah. And yet, and yet, 
our friends. (laughs) The brain isn't always logical. The brain isn't always, you know, the delegating. Uh, Oftentimes it's, I'm afraid I will no longer be adding value as a leader. Ah, and that's where you can start to test it. Like, is that how, how is that true? Or how is it not true? And, and this is part of the unlearning. Uh, there can be so much power in going, okay, so not only am I aware now that I interrupt, um, but I'm starting to understand when am I interrupting because it's a lack of intentional focus, Mm. impulsivity, Mm -hmm. using myself as an example. But when am I interrupting because I'm afraid I'm not going to be heard. And so how can I show up differently? And, and this, and this applies to, I I feel like any, any kind of ultimate behavior change or mindset change is there's, and, and is the, the value of identifying what do I need to start pruning? Or, you know, I think about, um, a coach I worked with, uh, a while ago that was, she talked about it as like, you're pulling little weeds. Mm. And the thing you have to understand is you're not pulling that weed once and it's gone. Ugh. Right? If I could pull weeds once in my front yard, <laughs> my yard would be amazing. Yeah, but same. I swear to God, the minute I pull one, four more <laughs> pop into its place. I'm like, hello, here I am. And so the same is true for unlearning. And and unlearning can be doing something. Unlearning could be how you're thinking about something. And, you know, one of the things I was curious to get your thoughts about, Teresa, as I was reflecting on our conversation is thinking about how much unlearning Mm. I've had to do on my journey of of working towards greater diversity, equity Mm. and inclusion Mm. and belonging. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. That in, in, in slice it and dice it whatever way you want. It's, so it's not about like, oh, is that unlearning or is that actually learning a new way of looking at stuff? It doesn't matter. It's just are you paying attention to it? But, you know, one of the biggest things that I still have to continue to unlearn is that just the reality that everyone's lived experience is different. And what that what's what's comfortable and right for me isn't going to be comfortable and right for other. I've had to unlearn um, or again, like this is something that I've been chewing on is uh, for those of you who maybe don't know, right, we're um, based in Iowa, and I was a very homogenous society. It's mm-hmm. a very white homogenous society. It's also homogenous in the terms of how people show up, right? Mm-hmm. There's a really high value of fitting in. There's a really high value of sameness, even if it's not, right, Uh just about race. And so like having to unlearn, not paying attention to who's got the the microphone paying attention to the the panel of of speakers up there i I don't know if i'm making sense here but that was something that i was just reflecting on or Mm. um uh, unlearning uh, beliefs and biases that i've held Mm. that well i'm a good person so i'm a good person therefore there's no way i could behave in ways that were racist and like that's just simply not true well and i think that's something that we see and by we, I mean the larger circle of of friends and colleagues that we run in. I don't mean just you and I. Yeah. Um, and I'm channeling our colleague Jill Mata here for a moment too, um, among others. But that's a common misstep of DEI work. Yeah. If we're just dumping new tools, if you were just like, it's a checkbox of, I need more diverse speakers for the purpose of more diverse yeah. speakers without yeah. doing the untangling, without yeah. calling attention to the messages in your operating system. You know, something that came up for me, just going back a little bit, we were talking about homogenous and that culture of sameness and some work around a courageous audit I did for myself Um, was related to some issues around motherhood. Um, Mm -hmm. And I love this process because it's, it can be applied to literally anything you're doing. Right. And so um, I want to go at this two ways. One is when you're, if you are a person and you're in the spot, like I was, and you need to go to that deeper level, look for the part that's uncomfortable to say out loud. And here's an Mm -hmm. example from yeah, it's not altruistic. Yeah. Uh-uh. What I was saying out loud was, well, I want to be a good mom. Mm-hmm. And so what I lovingly call out in that process is like, if you would put this on a button and wear it around, you haven't found it yet. It's not mm-hmm. uncomfortable mm-hmm. enough. You need to keep going. 
Because that'd be fine. You know, like I could say, Sarah, I'm really committed to being a good mom. And you'd say like, that's nice. <laughs> oh, that's and so then we move on, right? Like that's not the juicy thing. That doesn't need to be untangled, right? But th- this relates to the culture of sameness. But what I got to was I didn't want to be seen as a bad mom yeah. in front of the other people in this circle. And that does not feel good to say out loud. <laughs> that implies other behaviors and thoughts I have that are uh, part of like how I'm connecting to the bigger group, maybe fears I have related mm. to how I'm showing up in this group, right? There's much more to untangle there. Mm. Mm. And what is part of what was holding my behavior in place. And so um, I want to loop it back to mm. even as you're going through that process of the audit or you're going to that deeper place. There will abs. If it was that easy, you would have changed already. There are mm-hmm. there are things from your upbringing in there. There are societal norms, you know, very tied to the place you live, um, that will no doubt come up, um, whether it's related to your worth or you know whatever. Um, that's a common one. Your worth, whether that would be how yeah. others are perceiving you or how you're contributing. Um, it's part of what makes this process so valuable and, yeah. and seeing all of those things at play in yourself. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, again, back to this, people can have all the checklists they want related to things. If they don't understand why it matters, what's at stake, mm-hmm. what they do that gets in the way, you know, that's nice. We can have a beautiful, diverse panel and then we're only mm-hmm. promoting the same folks. So like mm-hmm. we got to mm-hmm. we got to do some work, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's a uh, some some other tools that are coming up, you know, as I think about this this practice of unlearning. And and again, the idea is not to shame. No. It's just to recognize and honor this is where I'm at yeah. and it's different than where I want to be. Um this is different than how I want to show up. This is, right? And and we always talk in our work, celebrate the catch that it's not about beating yourself up. It's not about like, oh, there, I did it again. But it's okay, that's Mm -hmm. an opportunity. I caught it to do something different. One of the questions we like to ask ourselves, uh, and you know, and (laughs) Teresa just did this to me recently. Uh Oh, (laughs) but is it no, but is it a rule or a possibility? Yeah, is it is it a rule that has to be done this way? Or is that just a possibility is another way, right? So some of the things I'm unlearning as a business owner, Mm. you know, the company started when it was just me, it's it, it was me for essentially, you know, 11 years. It was just me doing the work, going out and speaking, creating content, you know, Teresa comes on board, but it was still a few years before we were collaborating in the way. And it's really only been in the last year and a half, maybe two years where that started to shift. Mm. So my default, my autopilot, going back to that point, my autopilot is when there's maybe a significant client, all clients are significant, but let's say it's like a a different level of intention, Mm -hmm. intentionality, time, right? Um, With a client, my autopilot is, well, it'll be me because it's always been me. And, you know, we have a a situation, a client um, where I made this comment to Teresa and I said, well, so I'll, I'll probably be the first of this one. And she's like, but do you? And it was like, oh, Right. (laughs) Like I have to start unlearning what's possible as a business owner. Um, The other thing that I wanted to share is unlearning for me personally, not only has been so valuable um, as a leader, as a uh, practitioner of this work in my relationships, but it's probably been one of the hardest and yet most important skills I learn in managing my mental health. Mm. Um, some people may recall that end of last year, I, uh, shared and had the privilege of interviewing, uh, Dr. Martin Seif and Sally Winston, two experts in OCD. And because I was diagnosed with it. And again, here I have, oh, 42 years <laughs> of mm-hmm. patterns of wanting to seek certainty in situations that will never be certain. And, and so unlearning that is part of what has helped in my being able to manage it more effectively. But the the reason I bring that up is it has taken 
having Nick be super informed and aware of it. Obviously, my therapist is informed and aware of it and holding up that mirror when I'm asking questions, seeking certainty. And I'll just like share some real examples. Um, if I'm really tired, my brain is like, why was, why am I so tired? And it's trying to find the reason mm. for why I'm so tired. Mm. Um, our dog, Sally, sometimes when she gets overstimulated, she'll get seizures. Uh, it's usually really obvious. She was around a bunch of people that night when she finally unwinds. Recently, she had a seizure and it was like nothing, nothing. You couldn't point to anything to say this is why she mm. had a seizure. And my brain was getting fixated on but why would she have gotten it? You know, and, and, and so Nick does a really nice job of like, again, kind of that unlearning of it feels like you're looking for certainty in a situation that we may never be certain. And so the, the power of having someone who can ride co-pilot, having multiple co-pilots with you, right? Whether it's how we work together, Teresa, or your spouse, or your even your kids sometimes oh, yeah. can be really beautiful. <laughs> I mean, they may be the best mirrors of all, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> It's, it's uh, uh, unlearning, in my experience, it will never be as effective when it's a solo sport yeah. versus having somebody who has your back. And then that requires you to be open to that feedback, to be open to somebody pushing you to help you see where what you're doing is um, in conflict with how you're trying to show up. Yeah. And I want to get on the balcony with this. Yeah. Yeah. Because you mentioned celebrate the catch. And I want to break down for folks mm. celebrating the catch. Uh, at first, you're going to see it after it's happened. Right. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how it happens. And then slowly, you'll probably see it like, oh, it's coming out of my mouth now. Maybe I can yeah. course correct. <laughs> and then you're going to see it before it happens. Right. And the catch is you noticing your autopilot, you becoming yeah. aware of the wiring in your operating system. So celebrate the catch, call your brain's attention to, uh, cause your brain's running a lot of stuff. It's like, I got yeah. a heartbeat happening here. We're breathing. <laughs> I'm making eggs. What do you want me to do right You're, now? I'm making a yellow cake. I'm making a I, yellow uh... <laughs> cake. Come on. I got a lot happening. So, you know, pause and, and highlight that for your brain. Um, and the other thing that you demonstrated so beautifully, so I want to make sure everyone listening or watching with us caught it. You used the phrase, hold up the mirror. Mm. And that is a very different way of partnering mm. in this work than saying, you're doing it again. Yes. Why yeah, are you yeah, going yeah, yeah. on about there it you go. There uh -huh. you go. Oh, Don't worry about it. I thought you said you were working on that. I mean, think <laughs> of all the dismissive things or <laughs> oh, hurtful God. things yeah. as opposed to, I'm wondering if yeah. this fits into, right? A loving question or, yeah. uh, hmm, let's get on the balcony together. What do we think's going on right yeah. now? Right. Yeah. Um, if you, because I, I'm guessing this might be true for you and you chime in because you speak for you. What often happens if someone isn't holding a mirror and is kind of pushing back, they think yeah. they're pushing you, you cling more tightly or, you, yes. or the trust goes down. So either... Oh, I love you, but now I have to hold tighter to this because you're not seeing how how much it means to me or how hard yeah. this is. Or yeah. like, I guess I can't share it with you. Like, it, it will not result in things moving forward for learning purposes. It is almost always entrench in yeah. your behavior or, um, you know, harm to the relationship. So, I, what, yeah. what resonates for you? Or yeah, doesn't? that's such. A, I mean, yeah, no. I mean, all of that, all of that resonates for me because, and I appreciate that distinction because there are times when, again, people may mean well, yeah, but actually, what they're doing is silencing you or dismissing you, or again, if they're being sarcastic, mm. it can feel really cutting. And when it's something that people are genuinely committed to working on. Uh, how do you make it? I mean, and it goes both ways, right? On one hand, it's how do you if you're the one holding up the mirror, do it in a way that can be easier for the person to consider. Mm. And then the other flip side is, and then how do I go? Oh, man, you're right. Thank you. 
instead of like, God, why do you have to call me out all the time? Or yeah. why do you have to, you yeah. know, or, or, mm-hmm. or feeling shut down? And so it's, it's a, it's a, it depends kind of situation, but that is such an important distinction because we often see that, uh, I've experienced that I've been on the receiving end of it. And let me tell you folks, nothing is going to shut somebody down faster than you basically like shaming them, right. Yeah. For what they're doing. And even if your intentions are good, it doesn't matter. Your impact is sharp. And so, yeah. so what does this, what does this look like? Um, that's one thing that's coming up for me. The other thing, something you said, and, and this was something that came out of a session you and I did together last year of just that importance of how do we start shining a light mm. and becoming more conscious of our unconscious behavior, right? And that, and that's effort. And I'm wondering if you can speak to a little bit of, of just the reality of the time it takes. And I want to set up, I want to set this up mm. a little bit. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of bad stuff quote unquote mm. science i'm putting air quotes because it's not that's like it takes 21 days to break the <laughs> habit and 28 days to create a new habit that's yeah. why it's bullshit um bad it's not even science it's bad it's yeah. marketing but it's important for us because when you are somebody maybe you're a parent maybe you are uh, a, a partner maybe you're a family member maybe you're a co-worker maybe you're a boss maybe you're a team member whoever it is, you're in relationship with somebody. One of the traps I feel we see so often is when we're working on a behavior change, we want the amount of grace it takes for us to get there. When someone else is working on a behavior change, we don't understand why they haven't flipped a switch and turned the lights on and stopped doing their behavior. So just like I want I think that I, I have found unlearning can often be harder than learning something new. And so I'm curious to hear what comes up for you. Well, we had a little conversation about decluttering, you know, and decluttering is way more emotional than buying. Mm. Mm. I mean, like, just think about it. Oh God, that like, (laughs) yeah. I don't know. That hits. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, um, no, and I say that with love to everyone listening. Um, it takes, it's much harder, hmm. generally speaking, to let go of things we've been holding on to, to let go of things we've been rewarded for, to hmm. let go of things um, we learned so long ago we couldn't possibly put a finger on it because it's been reinforced thousands of times. And your point lands so well because. When we're trying to do something new that that requires some of that work of untangling so that we can pick up some new stuff, um, we want people to give, you know, well, it's going to take six months, you know, kind of a thing. And then the other person, it's like, we see this as a pitfall of of training, right? And I don't even love the word training, but whatever, we're going to use the word. I much prefer the word learning, but okay, here we are. If I, if people aren't instantly changed, it must've been a waste of time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if like, well, maybe if it's just a, a minor policy change that you can just reference in a book, uh, just page 89, you know, check it out. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about deep, deeply held behaviors, mindsets, ways of being, um, it takes much longer. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, anytime, honestly, Anytime I hear a number, I think that's way too low, whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, I said to a group maybe two weeks ago, whatever amount of time you think, triple it for sure. Like yeah, whatever yeah. it is, it's at least three times. Because here's the other thing, and I, I think we've seen quite a few examples of this, but where organizations want a huge change, an absolutely fundamental departure from how they have existed for a long time. And they want it instantly with instant payoffs. And that just isn't honoring the reality of how humans are going to be in a significant change. And, you know, goodness, this is my teacher heart coming out. And if it takes a few extra weeks for us to get where we're going in the big scope of the world, I think we'll still be okay. Like, can we leave space for people to do this important work, uh, giving them a little extra time? Because... Here's the thing. 
If the end that you have in mind or the goal or the organizational change matters that much, give people the time it takes to do it, to get there, yeah. to become it, right? Because that's, I think that's what's missed. And, and maybe I haven't articulated this sometimes even when we're talking. We're asking people to become something else, to, mm. to become someone else in essence. If I've been nurtured and mentored to behave this way and you want me to be this way, that's going to take me a little time. Yeah. Um, and, and, yeah. and as we've talked, you know, uh, uh, to various clients, mm. but I don't think we've explored on the show, but this will be something for a future, but I think it's worth just, um, it, planting the seed. It, not only is it going to take time, but it's going to take way more support yes. than companies understand <laughs> yes. and are willing to do it. And, and this is where, you know, when we talked about the courageous audit, mm. We said that the focus is on internally, what are you doing, not doing, mm -hmm. right? And that's not to minimize or dismiss the environment you're in. Yes. So I just want to be really clear that uh, that is a factor. Mm -hmm. It's just when we're doing the courageous audit, we want the focus to be on what we have control over. Exactly. First. Yep. And, and because, you know, we... Um, the environment matters. The structure of the system you're in matters. The people you surround yourself with matters. I am fortunate to be surrounded largely because of you all, right? Like our colleagues that we get to the privilege of working with, our strategic partners, uh, the work Nick and I are doing, that I am largely surrounded uh, and, and have surrounded myself with people who are actively working on their self-awareness, mm. who are actively working on their emotional regulation, who are actively working on having conversations that are hard. And guess what? No surprise, it makes it easier to be step to be able to step into those moments versus I'm thrown back, I take some training and I'm like, right, but my manager hasn't gone through this. They're not going to be right. supportive of it. <laughs> it's like, you know, this one of my favorite yeah. stories, one of my favorite stories is my last company I was at. Uh, Arag Legal. Uh, we were doing this major culture, major, major culture uh, shift. And, and we were doing it in the right, like we were doing it in a really effective way. Mm. Right. And I remember standing at the back of the, the room with my CEO. And he said, he looked at me, he's a man of few words, David. <laughs> he goes, uh, we're really lucky to have you. And I was like, I really appreciate that. And I, my response to him was, and I'm really lucky to have you because remember, I was this same person here as mm. I was at my last job, but I didn't get to thrive. I didn't get to lean into all of my gifts because of the environment. So I just, that's something I want to make sure that we yes. stay is that like the intention of the reflection is to start with self, but it doesn't dismiss or minimize or diminish mm -hmm. uh, the reality of being in a system that isn't set up for yeah. That doesn't make it easy for you to yeah. do what it is you're trying to do differently. Yeah. I no, that's a that's a beautiful place to be done right there. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. Teresa, you you always do such a good job of winding me down and like <laughs> we always we always I always joke that I have verbal leakage. Like, no. oh, do you have more? Like, no, no. the words are just coming out no. at this point. I mean, I, you <laughs> no, and I, I could go it. for like <laughs> two more hours, but I was like, it's probably it's probably yeah. time. I yeah. can't see Nick's face, but he's probably like <laughs> Yep. Wrap it up. <laughs> uh, so here's here's the invitation for you all. Um, one, no matter where you are, what country you're listening to us in, you know, we know we have friends in over 70 countries now. Mm. And no matter what time of day you're listening to this, send us a message. We it, we love to hear from you more than you realize, like more than you realize. Uh, True. You can always do, do that at podcast at sarahnollwilson.com. But let us know wh what what is something, when was a time you unlearned something? When mm. was a time, and you know, we'll keep it confidential between Teresa and I and the email, uh, but w when was a time you unlearned something or what is something you're actively working on or realizing that I'm, un I'm having to unlearn this? 
uh, behavior. It just, it's, it's so valuable for us and our learning and our thinking. And honestly, we just want to support you. I mean, we're, we have these conversations because we want to make an impact. So I say this with love, my friends across the world, send us messages at podcast at sarahnollwilson.com. And it will be one of us who will respond to you. Um, and we would just love to hear what comes up for you. Final thoughts, Teresa, as we close out this conversation. Mm. Be kind to yourself Mm. and push your own thinking. I love it. It's always such a treat to have you on, Teresa. Thanks for bringing your insight and wisdom. And please be sure to take a picture of that cake. (laughs) We'll link to it in the show notes. Yeah. just kidding. <laughs> but we will put Teresa's contact information in the show notes. Uh, yeah. So Teresa, we asked this of everyone, what's the best way for people to connect with you if they want to get your yellow cake recipe uh, from scratch? Uh, or if they want to learn more about your world and the work yeah, you Yeah, you can reach out to me anytime, Teresa at sarahnollwilson.com. I love to hear from you. Also on LinkedIn, Teresa Peterson, EDD. Uh, yeah, that's where I'm at. All right. Thanks for being on the show, my dear. My pleasure. Our guest this week has been Dr. Teresa Peterson, my colleague, my one of my favorite people in the whole world. And I always learn something from her every time we're in conversation. And one of the things I'm, I felt in a very personal way <laughs> is the idea that decluttering takes way more effort and more emotional energy than buying something. And that feels feels like that can work on many levels from where I'm at. And we want to hear from you. Uh, wherever you're joining us from, send us a message at podcast at sarahnollwilson.com. And we are the ones who read it and will respond to it. And if you want to support the show, be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your preferred podcast platform. You also can support the show financially by becoming a patron. You can go to patreon.com com slash conversations on conversations, where not only you'll get really great swag, but you'll get early episodes and episodes without ads. Who doesn't want that? I want to do a huge thank you to the team that makes this show possible to our producer, Nick Wilson, our sound editor, Drew Knoll, our transcriptionist, Becky Reinert, our marketing support, Jessica Burge, and the rest of the Snowco crew. Thank you all so much for joining. This has been Conversations on Conversations. And remember, when we change the conversations we have with ourselves and others, we can change the world. So my friends, please rest, rehydrate, and we'll see you again next week.